Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Oxford Master School. Welcome to the last of this term's lecture series. Um, today, the title, Production, Reproduction, Empowerment, the Future of Women in Africa. We have a double bill of speakers. Uh, we're going to hear first from Professor Sandy Fredman, who is founder and director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub and Rose Professor of Law here at the university. Um, and then uh, we will hear from Professor Joe Boyden, director of Young Lives Project and professor of international development, also here at the university in the Department of International Development. Um, each, I think, is going to speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will have um, both uh, Joe and Sandy up here and time for some question and answer after both have presented. Um, so I welcome first Sandy to the stage. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone for coming on this cold and dark evening um, and it's uh, really a pleasure to be able to present what we think is one of the, the, the you know the most crucial and, and pressing challenges going forward um, so, so we know that one of the most intractable sources of inequality globally today is that between men and women um, and although women are increasingly entering into the paid workforce, they're invariably doing this on poorer terms and conditions, and the aspiration of decent work is still very elusive. What is widely recognized is that a key issue, a key obstacle to women's empowerment, to women achieving equality, is the relationship between production and reproduction. That is, women's ongoing primary responsibility that is attributed to them for childcare, for unpaid domestic work, and unpaid care work more generally. This is not just an issue which affects them at the moment of having children or entering the workforce. It permeates their whole life course. So for women, from the time when they are, are, are young girls in the home, uh, the stereotypes attached to what it means to it being primarily responsible for childcare and unpaid work affects the, kind, the ways in which they are brought up, the opportunities presented to them, uh, the kind of education that they have, and eventually, if and when they do enter the paid workforce, um, the work they do is undervalued, partly because it can be done unpaid in the home. So although this is widely recognized, um, this boundary between production and reproduction has nevertheless been very tenacious and very difficult to overcome from a policy and a regulatory perspective. Um, for example, labor lawyers and human rights lawyers, from which I come from, that discipline, very much concentrate on, on the labor market and on adjusting uh, labor rights and looking for ways of achieving decent work without being able to adjust the division of labor in the home. This is a particularly important challenge in African countries where the, uh, the, there is an unprecedentedly large number of young people and a huge challenge actually for both girls and boys uh, in relation to finding work, never mind decent work. And if it's going to be challenging for boys and girls, this issue of the relationship between production and reproduction is particularly difficult for girls and women during their life course. So how, how do we go forward? This has become such a stubborn and intractable problem. What seems obvious is that we need, and certainly from a policy and a labor law and a human rights law perspective, we need a much more fine-grained approach where we can really have an in-depth understanding of the, the, the patterns that uh, join together to 
continually perpetuate these outcomes. And uh, that's why the potential collaboration between us, between um, Joe and, and myself and our different disciplines, uh, together with economists and so on, um, is, is so fruitful. Um, how we can better understand from very rich data which Joe has collected and the much more macro, broad approach which you find in human rights and labor law um, so that we can attempt to really address this challenge. So what I'm going to do um, in my part of the talk is just simply outline the human rights framework and the, at a very macro level, the promises, the aspirations, and yet uh, the gaps in implementation and how these can really be made to change, uh, to work at uh, community, local, and national level. So we are, there's no shortage of promises and of recognition. We can see Kofi Annan's statement in 2005 where he says there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. No other policy is as likely to raise economic productivity or to reduce infant and maternal mortality. No other policy is as sure to, impose, to improve nutrition and promote health. No other policy is as powerful in increasing the chances of education for the next generation. So a wholly beneficial outcome for empowerment of women. And this has been given an even stronger policy stamp and reinforcement through the Sustainable Development Goals, which promises that by 2030, uh, we will empower women and girls everywhere. Um, but this does recognize the stubborn barriers of production and reproduction. And these are just some figures uh, internationally, but equally true within Africa, of um, the extent to which women are still attributed with primary responsibility for uh, reproductive and caring work. Um, and yet they are also requiring to, be, to, to do more and more productive work. So on average, women do three times as much unpaid care and domestic work as men. And this is a breakdown. And you can see in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the second from the right, um, the, the, the gap between unpaid care work done by women and by men, which um, is not as bad as other areas, like the first two, but worse than some, but the whole pattern globally is, is very much the same. Um, so how do we surmount these barriers? Well, the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, do give some more detail to how they think we can uh, address this. The first and most important is to recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work, and then the solutions that they give are through the provision of public services, infrastructure, and social protection policies, and the promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the family. Um, and remembering that the, the real importance of um, infrastructure, such as access to water, access to electricity, which it decreases domestic work so substantially for women. Um, but they say it has to be nationally appropriate. And this is where the work that we, 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 we would hope to do with young lives um, to make these policies really work and matter at national level. But how do we get there? So what I'm going to talk a little bit in the next few minutes is just a bit more about the human rights framework. And Joe is going to talk more about the evidence base. So, in the international human rights framework, there are some, amongst the, the, the several sources, there are some particularly important ones which I wanted to highlight. The first is the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, which has this very central provision, Article 5, 
which talks about dismantling stereotypes. And it says that states' parties shall take all appropriate measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women with a view to achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority or the superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotype roles for men and women. And also to ensure that family education includes a proper understanding of maternity as a social function and the recognition of the common responsibility of men and women in the upbringing and development of their children, it being understood that the interest of the children is the primordial consideration in all cases. Now, the, the reason I highlight this particularly is this is very widely ratified, bearing in mind that some states have got reservations against this principle, but it is um, a, uh, an international convention that many states have signed up to. Um, there's also the right to education, and we will see that the right to education needs to be fitted in with all the other kinds of policy measures, particularly this issue about stereotyping, if the right to education is really going to do the kinds of things which it's often said to do, um, because we'll see from Joe's presentation that if it's embedded in cultural stereotypes and a life course of women being seen as primarily responsible for reproductive care, even the right to education on its own may not overcome that. Then there's the ILO, the uh, International Labour Organization's Decent Work Agenda, and what they, uh, what this calls for from the work side, so the CEDAW was more from the home side, of work that is productive, gives a fair income and security in the workplace, and social protection for the family, equal opportunities in treatment, freedom to organize and participate in decision making, and it sees gender as a cross-cutting theme. So that's the International Labour Organization. And just as, as, as a final um, point at this very macro level, um, to look at the African Protocol on the Rights of Women, um, which is actually very extensive and in its own, within its own boundaries, um, recognizes many of the issues, which is that uh, states who sign up to the protocol commit themselves to create conditions to support economic activities of women, particularly in the informal sector. And we know that in many, in almost all countries in Africa, the formal sector, that is um, the sector in which people are employed in a kind of permanent uh, situation with a single employer, is very small. The informal sector is the largest uh, source of employment and the most difficult to achieve decent work in. So that's uh, an important issue. Also to establish a system of protection and social insurance for women working in the informal sector and sensitize them to adhere to it. And that's quite interesting, maybe we can talk about later what, what that actually means. To recognize the economic value of the work of women in the home, to guarantee adequate and paid pre and postnatal maternity leave, and to recognize that both parents bear the primary responsibility for the upbringing of children, and that this is a social function for which the state and private sector have secondary responsibility. So all of these things are very high aspirations, again, apparently binding legal commitments, but if we look at the facts and the social facts on the ground, we find a very different reality. So the challenge is how do we take these um, big commitments and actually make them happen and make them happen in a way which makes a difference to uh, the lives of women in, in African countries. And that's where we need the um, much more fine-grained, detailed data which young lives can provide. Um, so I'll hand over to Joe on that score. Thank you, Sandy, for laying out the, the territory, as it were. So um, Young Lives um, is a study of childhood poverty. 
and uh, one of the four countries that the study is in is Ethiopia. So we, we thought it would be helpful just to illustrate some of the challenges involved in, in women's empowerment in the context of Ethiopia. Um, in Ethiopia, we've been following uh, 3,000 children in two different age groups, um, one of which was born around the time of the millennium, around 2001, and an older group that were born in 1997. And the reason um, I wanted to highlight that is because um, by having two age groups, we can compare their circumstances. They, we, we've interviewed the younger ones at the same age that we've interviewed the older ones, and so we can see whether things are improving for the younger ones or, or not. So let's just go to the background for Ethiopia. Um, for those of you who know the country, you'll be aware that the government makes a really strong emphasis on economic growth, and actually there's been quite significant growth over at least the last decade or so. Um, however, livelihoods, particularly in rural areas, remain extremely precarious. Um, another thing that the government has been very effective with has been um, expanding of, of services and infrastructure. Roads um, and other systems are in much better shape than they were just a couple of decades ago. And also health and education in particular have expanded enormously. There's also been a push on industrialization and on the commercialization of agriculture. And this is really important in terms of the implications for children as they're growing up. Um, it's important, I think, to highlight some of the big policy priorities in Ethiopia. Education access at all levels is being prioritized. So although it started with primary schooling, uh, we're seeing expansion in secondary education and in tertiary education. And there have been quite a lot of um, efforts to emphasize education for girls in particular. So girls are a priority in their access. Um, at the same time, there are the legal regulations on children's work, which prevent children under age 14 um, from working in, in paid and um, non-family types of work, but also prohibit um, the worst forms of child work. There's also um, a strong thrust in relation to what are called harmful traditional practices. There's a committee that's responsible for monitoring these. And there are over 100 and 120 or 140 practices that have been identified, many of which actually are focused on children. And among those, female circumcision or, or female genital mutilation and child marriage are two of the most important practices um, that, they're, that are seek, they're seeking to eliminate. And that's important because these, um, particularly child marriage, affects women more than it does men. At the same time, however, there is a law that prohibits NGOs from advocating on children's rights. So although there's quite a lot of emphasis on children's rights, this is very much a government-driven agenda. And I think it's important to underline the assumptions behind these policies. One is that traditional practices are a barrier to societal development, economic development, and that's why the government is focusing on eliminating them, because there's a real um, enthusiasm for modernization across Ethiopia. And the other assumption is that girls' education is weaker than boys. Um, it's undermined in particular by low demand and by early marriage. So we'll move now from these policy um, assumptions and, and the policy agenda to the reality on the ground. So I think the first point to make is that gender norms are really, really entrenched from a very, very early age. Children begin working at a very young age, maybe around three or four, and by the age of five, six, or seven, they're working considerably and in support mostly of their families. And I think the important point to emphasize is that the roles and responsibilities that are awarded to boys are very different from those that are awarded to girls. So boys are expected from a very early stage to become dependable economically. This means that they're expected to do productive work and sometimes paid work as well. So in the rural context, that will mean farming, herding livestock and fishing. Um, and generally, um, it's, it's encouraged both for, for boys because they're making a contribution to their households, but also because these, these roles are learnt importantly in early childhood so that they can become more effective in their adult roles. Similarly for girls, 
early learning of, of gendered roles are very, is very, very important. Uh, but in this case, it's their reproductive roles that are emphasized. So in other words, roles that will facil facilitate their marriage and their effective parenthood. So they do a lot of the cooking. Um, there are lots of specific responsibilities that girls take on, and they take away from their mothers, baking bread, making what, which is a, a sauce, um, and making and selling beer, fetching firewood and water, and sibling caretaker. These, these are the roles that are most commonly allocated to girls. In relation to all of this, female circumcision plays its part um, the, the cultural logic, the rationale, is that it prepares girls for marriage. It actually is believed that um, it enables girls to be more efficient in, in their domestic responsibilities, less clumsy in the kitchen, and more compliant in the home. So it's, it's, that's the value that's put on female circumcision, and it, it relates very closely to the work roles that they're given. However, I would emphasize that these what appears on the surface to be a rather fixed set of gendered norms, actually in practice can be quite variable. And household size, household composition, uh, the numbers of boys or the numbers of girls, birth order and other factors actually make quite a significant difference. And we have in our data many examples of children who are doing the role of the opposite sex um, because Maybe they're the only boy or the only girl or they're the oldest boy or the oldest girl in the family. And this even includes, as in this case, Hadush, who is the youngest of um, eight children. He's the only boy in the family and he cares for the cattle of the family full time while his sisters are all at school. So I think it's just important to be aware that st stereotypes are not always adhered to. Um, one of the things that really surprised us in our, in our findings is that actually education aspirations are extremely high in Ethiopia. And this is even in a context where um, many of the parents have not actually been educated themselves or where schooling is part time or where children are not getting much access to school. And I just want to emphasize that um, caregivers, parents, have a very clear view that they want their children to go to university. This is at age 12, when their children are age 12. However, things changed between the, um, the older cohort, when they were age 12 in 2006, and the younger cohort, who were age 12 in 2013. So while parental aspirations were higher for their boys in the older cohort, with the younger cohort, it was actually um, girls' parents who were more ambitious. So we've seen quite an important shift here in terms of gendered aspirations at schooling. Um, children's own aspirations are also very high, although they were not as high as, as caregivers at any point. Um, and the proportion of rural boys who aspire to go to university actually fell by two, uh, 2013. So boys' aspirations are lower, and also the parents' aspirations are lower when it's for boys. Um, it's interesting that urban girls in particular were the highest, most aspiring of all, and 85% of them wanted to reach university in 2013. And this is a significantly greater percentage than had that aspiration in 2006. So in some ways, this, this data appears to buck the trend in terms of what one might expecting. So then it's worth looking at what's actually happening to children at the age of 12 in Ethiopia. And this is really looking at their time use and the time use in particular between um, school and work. So in particular the gender disparities were actually quite marked and boys were less likely to be enrolled in school and they were much more likely to be working and the gap was actually widening over time, so that in the younger children at age 12, this was more apparent than it had been in the older ones. And in 2006, a full 60% of the boys, compared to just 12% of girls, were overage for their grade. So not only were aspirations for boys lower, they were less likely to be in school, but they were more likely to be repeating grades. So they were not performing so well in school. There's also a very marked divide between rural and urban children. 
Um, and school enrollment, perhaps not surprisingly, this is consistent with data from many other countries. Enrollment was lower for rural children than for urban children. And rural children were also less likely to have completed um, the appropriate um, age for grade at the age of 12 than were urban children. And in fact, it's a significant difference between rural and urban children in our case. And also, urban children were working significantly fewer hours by 2013 than they were in 2006. So, also, we have, the, in, by 2013, the time that rural girls were spent working had fallen, but the figure for boys remained the same. So this is, this is really, again, reinforcing what would seem to be a rather different picture from the one that is painted as sort of in, in global policy and um, in you know, global concerns and priorities. It's also important to highlight that there are big differences, as Sandy was saying, in terms of the type of work that are done, is done by children. So the boys are much more likely to be attracted into um, farms and, and family farms and enterprises, and girls more likely into domestic chores and caring. But even so, if you see the, the comparisons between the 12-year-olds in 2013 and 2006, Girls were working um, less hours than, than uh, that. Everybody was working less hours um, in the care roles by, by 2013. But also the differences between girls and boys are not necessarily very significant. And urban girls in particular were working less hours in domestic tasks by 2013. So this is the, the, the trend is definitely for a reduction in children's work between uh, 26, uh, 2006 and 2013. And I just want to cite an example from one of the Young Lives sites, which is a rural community, Zaytuni. Um, here, uh, boys in particular were really struggling. And by 2013, their school participation had declined dramatically, and the hours they were working had risen to over six daily, so they were really much more engaged in work than they were at school. Now, what's interesting here is that this is one of the many rural communities where the government has been encouraging both industrial off-farm enterprises, but also in many communities, there's been um, encouragement of irrigation, irrigated farming, which is increasing commercial, commercial ventures of farming and basically raising incomes in farming. It's changing the way children uh, planning for the future and the way families are planning for future. In particular, boys are being able to take advantage of productive um, jobs, roles that they might not otherwise have been able to access at a time when farming traditionally was through rain-fed agriculture only. It was not going to offer the same attractions as these new uh, occupations do. And as you can see from um, Desta's mother, she sees that the stone crushing work that he's doing, which actually is really tough work, and it's work that girls initially started doing and they were excluded from. Um, over time, more and more boys were going into this work and fewer and fewer girls. It was increasingly defined as a male occupation. But the point is, even though it's very tough work, it offers an entry point into a job for the future and it also offers uh, training in skills which enable a child to, to be a, a functioning um, adult worker. So it becomes quite attractive and it attracts children away from school, particularly boys. So now I want to turn to child marriage and early parenthood. We were actually surprised that the prevalence of girls marrying young under the age of 18 in Ethiopia was actually lower than in our other countries, which is Peru, India, and Vietnam. Although even here, where girls are married, the median age was very young, 16, just over, well, over 16 years, and two-thirds of those who are married had babies already by the age of 19. What's important is that it's enormously variable in Ethiopia by region, and this is a cultural issue, so it's much more common in the north, but it's also much more common amongst poorer girls. Another factor which came out of our research, which was very interesting, is that the government actually has, has very severe penalties for female circumcision, which includes imprisonment and fines. 
parents are very compliant, but girls themselves are really worried that they're no longer being circumcised. And we came across a number of cases, in particular in certain areas, where girls are getting themselves circumcised because they're really terrified that they will not be marriageable. They won't be considered marriageable if they're not circumcised. So the incentive still remains. It's very important to highlight that paid work by girls at age of 15 is a significant predictor of early marriage. And indeed, some girls choose to get married because they consider it to be lighter as a role and, and a responsibility than continuing in paid work. A lot of the paid work is considered to be very hard. Also, and this is key when you think of some of the, the points that Sandy was making, marriage profoundly affects girls' time use. Girls aged 19 who are married or living with a partner did up to eight hours a day in unpaired care work. And there it is, in essence. So while previously they were not, once they're married, that's it. They are then drawn right into unpaid care work. So it's quite a dramatic shift that takes place. OK, so I just want to reflect on some of those findings. I think it's interesting to, to, to point out that there is no systematic bias against girl in time at work, and they do better than boys at school, but they are still channeled very early into reproductive roles. The opportunity costs of schooling, on the other hand, are much higher for boys, in rural areas particularly, and early entry into work is seen as a better guarantee of future employment, which is, which is what seemingly gives boys an advantage in the, in the workplace. But at the same time, the seeming advantage that girls get in education is misleading. Actually, the quality of the education on offer is really low, and I haven't really talked about that, but actually, even girls, when they're performing well according to local grades, they still don't learn very much at school. And of course, if they're getting married early anyway, and if that's their main role in adulthood, then education really isn't making a big difference to their future employment options. Even though early marriage and parenthood among girls was not as prevalent as we might have expected in Ethiopia, in our sample, the cultural and economic incentives are really strong and they remain so. And these roles are key to entry into adulthood. So it's no, it's no um, <coughs> incidental matter that it's, it's the poorest girls who are most likely to marry young, but also girls who face family Ill, illness and family crisis. And I think that the link with poverty is very strong. Commercial agriculture and off-farm rural employment threaten boys' schooling, and actually they don't provide decent work. So although one might celebrate the trend towards off-farm employment and the, the improvement of product, um, productivity in rural agriculture, the quality of the jobs that, that boys are, are taking on is actually very low, and there's a lot of evidence we have of dangerous and difficult jobs that they're undertaking. So this is not meeting the ILO's decent work agenda by any means. And I think, finally, the idea that education is perhaps the single most important mechanism for girls' empowerment and for achieving um, a sort of equity in the workplace for girls Actually, it risks, massively risks failing if there aren't good, job, good jobs at the end of it. So if girls are not expected to go into the, into the workplace anyway, and if boys are not finding good jobs, the incentives remaining uh, for, for staying in school are not very high. And we do see declining aspirations for education that actually reflect this lived reality in terms of employment. Thank you. So I'll ask Sandy to join us up here, and uh, we have a roving mic. Um, but before we take any questions, I do need to warn you, it's being filmed and uh, live webcast. So please only ask a question if you're comfortable with that. Um, so do we have any questions? Any show of hands? Here. That's fascinating. I just wanted to ask you, what are the views of these girls once we are drawn into early marriage? Are they happy with their lot? Are they uh, well-treated? Um, because 
it's not necessarily lack of empowerment that girls are marrying young, it's what happens afterwards, isn't it? Shall I answer straight away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the younger, the girls who marry youngest have less choice in the matter. Marriages tend to be arranged by their parents. Um, the girls who are older when they marry often elope with a partner, so it's more about their choice. And elopements and indeed abductions, some of the abductions are almost really elopements, but they're when boys abduct a girl to marry her. One of the reasons why they abduct a girl is because they pay a lower dowry than they would if they were eloping or, or if it was an arranged marriage. So there are different kinds of marriages and there are marriages that take place at different ages. From the evidence that we have, there's, because there is less choice for the younger ones, it can be a very difficult experience. Um, and certainly some of the ones even who chose to get married then later regret, regretted it. And, and actually we've already got quite a few divorces. Um, and often girls who are divorced are left on their own with the children and without much support. I think one of the things that's really key is that if a marriage is arranged by the parents, then if a girl is divorced, she's more likely to get their support down the line. If, however, she has run away and, and eloped with her partner, then actually she will not necessarily get the support. And there are examples of girls who are on their own with babies who are not getting support from anybody. So they can end up in a really dire situation. But that's not just about the age of marriage. It's, it's very much about the extent to which the family approved it in the first place. I think it's worth highlighting that the, the, the situation in many parts of Africa is very different, from, say, from South Asia. In South Asia, the, the age disparity between a, a girl who marries very young and her partner is like to be, likely to be very big. Whereas in Africa, it's often actually young people of more or less the same age and generation. So it has very different implications. And I think there's probably fewer failures than, than you would get in, in, well, fewer examples of exploitation and abuse than you might get in a context where the age difference is really significant. So there's no easy answer, if that's the short way of putting it. <laughs> An article came out earlier this week in The Guardian that was looking at the relationship between climate change and the likelihood that this might increase uh, child marriages. I was wondering if you'd come across any of that in your research. It, it's a really common phenomenon, not just from Young Lives Research. I, I know that there's much evidence, for example, in Bangladesh, heavy flooding which uh, leaves families without their animals and their land often results in, in um, an increase in early in, in child and early marriage. Um, I know that in war zones, amongst refugee populations, you'll find a rise in marriage of girls. It's a protective mechanism. It's a way in which families are able to um, reduce the number of mouths they have to feed on the one hand, but also it's perceived to be as a way of protecting girls, especially in a very volatile humanitarian crisis. Of course, the real point is, and the point that goes back to the first question is, to what degree is this really protective? Um, and that's where it's debatable. But from some points of view, for some families, I think the point is, and the point that really Sandy was making, is that there are so few options for, for very poor girls and for very poor families in many contexts. And if, if um, entering the workplace is not perceived to be appropriate for a girl, then marriage is the option that, that is chosen, because that that is meant to secure their future. And I think that that's still, and we have a lot of evidence in our data of how conflicted parents feel. Actually, in Ethiopia, the government does do children's rights education in schools. And that education says that it's a girl's right not to get married, it's the right to choose for themselves. And so parents don't know what to do about it because they really do believe that, that it's a protective mechanism. And they don't know what the alternative is. They worry a lot about, um, uh, unprotected sex outside marriage and STDs and um, you know the risk of pregnancy outside marriage and so on which it which actually is a very real risk for, for girls when the marriage age is raised so it's not necessarily so straightforward um, I'm really curious about the conclusion that uh, good jobs is kind of the limitation to education, the opportunities available to young people after schooling. 
And so I was wondering, what is the actual situation of young people who do make it through uh, in quite a few years of schooling? What are the opportunities that are available? And then what are the implications on the legal side? Because it seemed as though much of the policy was focused on advocating for education. And so then how would you adapt all of these uh, legal tenants to uh, to take into account this this need for good opportunities after schooling? Do I start? Oh, yeah, you go. Well, I think um, one of the key issues, which is partly what was being highlighted, was this need to take uh, what we would call a holistic approach. That is to see the way in which these different elements all interact with each other. So it's not just having an education or being in school, as Joe found. It's what they what they learn at school, and whether the families see uh, school as a somewhere for them just to stay until they get married, or whether they actually see schooling as um, in improving their opportunities for decent work. So the way in which um, what education does and what education provides needs to be geared towards to some extent needs to fit in with the family structure and the cultural expectations, but also there needs to be a proper um, push towards decent work for everyone. And that's one of the things that the legal regulation can do, which is to say, if you do go into the workforce, there are certain basic terms and conditions which will make your work valuable for enough for the family to seek to continue to educate you. So we have to think about it together. And that's where the international labor standards come in, because what they try and do is provide a floor of rights to prevent a race to the bottom, to prevent undercutting. What employers and, and governments often say is that they can't afford it. If you don't provide work at these very low standards or allow that kind of work, you won't get any inward investment and the economy won't grow. But I, uh, I think the, the key point there is that, um, as we've seen, you do have to have decent work for all these other, for it to become a virtuous circle. And one, one place you could start is to say, we have to have minimum wages, we have to have proper health and safety at work, and so on. So one of the studies that, um, that a related study, not, not Young Lives itself, was um, about um, factory work, where, which was actually initially employing quite a lot of young women, but very soon they dropped out because the terms and conditions were so bad that they would rather not. The health, they, they, even the health and safety conditions were so bad. So I think from the legal side, it's very important to insist on a floor of rights, a floor of decent terms and conditions, to prevent undercutting and to prevent a race to the bottom, to make everything else, in a sense, worthwhile for everyone. I think just to add to that, one of the one of the things I feel most strongly about is not to ban children from working from a sector just because, according to sort of global norms and standards, it doesn't necessarily rise to the standards. Because you you by banning work rather than enabling better conditions at work, you risk actually that they do much more dangerous activities. It goes underground. Um, work that used to be in factories gets um, put out to uh, smaller units where it can't be regulated. There's a very famous case of this in Bangladesh where, the, um, where US legislation was tabled to ban all um, work, all garments and all products that were produced by child labor. The um, garment manufacturers responded because they were so worried about losing their market and they threw 50,000 mostly girls out of work overnight. And actually, um, a follow-up study that looked at what happened to those girls, and the whole, the whole rationale for this was that they would go into school instead of being in exploitative work. And in fact, a follow-up study found that most of them ended up either chipping bricks, selling flowers on the streets, or in prostitution. Not one of them ended up in school. So it was actually very, very poorly thought through and I think that's where Sandy's point about local context and really understanding conditions. From the point of view of those girls, this was the first time that, that young females had had opportunities for paid employment that was not domestic employment. It was the first time that they actually had large numbers of girls in paid work. It was a, a liberating force and not 
an exploitative force in that particular context. Yeah, there's one in front here. How do you go, up, um, go about supporting girls um, and their empowerment regarding the, uh, female circumcision? Um, because I completely understand that it can be um, like incredibly dangerous and it's banned and their parents support it and um, it can discourage the marriages that, as you previously said, can be very difficult experiences. Um, but to what point is it empowering if it's... Um, to prevent it if it's going against their choices like where would you stand um supporting it like uh, morally i suppose just how do you support it gosh that's a really difficult that's a sort of moral maze type question um i think you know so, so there are some people who would argue that the the right to anybody for personal agency should ab be above everything else i mean certainly um, in the West, that's often the case, and so um, women have claimed the right to genital surgeries, which actually are not much different in some cases from the kind of um, surgeries that are carried out in, in many parts of Africa, and that's recognized as their right to do so. That's their freedom uh, that they act of choice, whereas this is seen as an oppressive force against girls, and there are many very powerful campaigners, in, including you know, female advocates who are very much against it. My, my own view is that you always need to look at the social risks and the social costs to girls and to their families, and I think it should be a negotiation between conflicting priorities and conflicting concerns, because as you say, there are, really are health risks, and you know, there are lots of reasons why one might want to consider banning, but I don't think ban it's the same with banning extreme forms of, of work, dangerous work. Banning rather than enabling seems to me to be presenting increased risks. I think what one really needs to do is work with, you know, work with the regulations, work with uh, norms, legal norms and values in a very kind of bottom-up way, which is about, you know, building consensus and, 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 and finding alternative options. I think that's probably the way I would go about it. That's speaking as an anthropologist rather than a lawyer. Well, um, I, I think what that shows really, again, is that um, it's about how you achieve your aim and you, you, need, you need to keep the, the aim separate from what are effective means of, of yeah. achieving it. So um, I think that choice is, is, could be very constricted and we, we don't necessarily need to say that because someone chooses something that uh, it's uh, to be accepted socially. So the, the, why the, the, the international human rights law uh, against female genital mutilation is very clear, but the problem is, and that's why working with these very fine-grained, detailed social uh, understanding is so important for regulatory systems, is to make sure that what you do achieves what you want to do it, what you expect, and not uh, make it more dangerous by driving it underground, by, by, by women going in, in you know, the equivalent of backstreet um, circumcisions, but that you do enable by working with the communities. And some of those projects have been very successful yeah, yeah. by working with communities and, and, and changing the norms. And that's why, again, coming back to the CEDAW provision, which is about really recognizing that law has to work together with cultural norms and finding ways of, of doing that is the challenge. Okay, we had some questions from hands at the back. If you, if you go right to the back on the right and then we'll work our way forward. Hi, uh, I was curious to know what impact education has on social structures and does it help in breaking stereotypes of roles that a man and a woman are supposed to play in the household? And the other one is how does media help um, do, do exposure to Western media help them understand sharing households? Or I don't know, does it have a negative impact or does it probably have some element of positive influence? Um, that's, that I'm not sure I can really answer the question very effectively. I mean, I think education has very different impact in different, in different countries. 
So um, in our study, the best education system in the four countries is definitely Vietnam. Vietnam in, in Vietnam, the education system is pro-poor. In other words, it benefits poorer children more than it benefits better off children. Both better off children come into school performing better than poorer children, but poorer children catch up with them over the, over the year. And also, girls tend to do better in the Vietnamese education system than boys, so it's actually been very pro-girl as well. But we have the case in India where it's pretty much the opposite. Um, and the risk is that you get entrenched uh, values and entrenched inequalities, and because basically um, poorer children access poorer schools, so they, you know, they can fall behind be through the fault of the education system, if you like. And I don't think we have a lot of evidence that education is explicitly trying to um, bring about greater uh, in gender, in uh, gender equality. I think what, what it is doing, it's very focused often on building cognitive skills and very specific, rather narrow skills. And as far as I can tell, um, the school systems aren't necessarily biased against girls in that respect, but they're not necessarily trying to work at the, the biggest structural problems at all. And I mean, certainly that's one of the challenges we have in the study is to try and you know, make education policy makers much more aware of the ways in which education can do more harm in some, in some respects than, than it's doing good. So just to add to that, I think there's, there's, there's a big move, certainly in the human rights community too, to move beyond talking about right to education per se as a, as a, as a blanket thing to talking about right to quality education. And you saw as well that the CEDAW, the Women's Convention, makes a very important point that education should include values of uh, trying to change those gendered stereotypes that could be reinforced through schools. And th there is that also the interesting example of, of India where, which, which you probably have, have come across, that through the right to education was included the right to hot meals at school. And one of the, one of the beneficial consequences of that was that families sent their daughters to school where they might not have otherwise. So that the family, the, the work that the, the girls were doing at home to, to bring in more food could be compensated for by the fact that they got free hot meals at school. So it has to be thought about inventively as to how, in that case, it started off as a right to food, turned into a right to hot meals at school, turned into a very beneficial way of, of, of the right to education being applied. And even building private toilets at school makes a massive impact on girls' ability to attend because it's very hard for girls, particularly during menstruation, to stay at school. And that's been a big issue in India in particular. And safety at school, lack of you know, violence, bullying, mm. and so on. Hi. Uh, you mentioned something about how you found uh, that boys were usually overaged in their grades as compared to their female cohorts. So I was wondering if your research, were you looking at anything into the masculinities and issues of masculinities? You know, because we're, even I included, we're so focused on women's empowerment, we forget to look at male disempowerment. I don't think I can say a great deal about masculinities, but I, but I can say that um, I think boys' work is definitely interfering with their schooling more than girls' work is. In other words, the kind of jobs that boys do. I think probably um, the levels of attendance are actually very intermittent. And in fact, we, we did a school observation study in one of the communities, and there was a hole in the fence um, around the school playground, and the children were popping in and out of school all day long to go and irrigate farms and to work um, on farms nearby. And I think one, if you look at the sort of everyday realities of schooling, I think it becomes quite a, quite a challenge, and for boys in particular, because of these expectations, I mean, that's where the masculinity issue does come in, because of the expectation that they will earn income, that they will support their families, and, and so on. There comes a point when school is, is really no point for them anymore, because actually the pressure on them is so much greater to be in work. I think it's a question of watching this space. We need to do more research on, on, on these issues. By the way, we haven't even analyzed. There was an earlier question about the outcomes of these children. 
We haven't yet got to the point where we know where they actually ended up at age 22, for instance. We're just in the process of analyzing, did they get into informal work, care work, um, paid work, what kinds of jobs they're doing? That's the next step. Okay, Claire, can we um, come on this side now? I think we're, we're running out of time, so um, maybe two more. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could add something about um, what are the societal norms connected to birth control? I don't know if you did any studies on that. And is it changing at all? Is it quite similar? Uh, is it available? Um, and my second question was, you talked about the child marriages were being children of quite a similar age. And I was wondering if that means that there's lots of boys being married um, off by their families as well, or what's the sort of power relation within that? Yeah, no, there are far fewer boys married under, under the age of 19. So it's about 1% in our sample, and much fewer still who have children. So it's, not, it's much more significant amongst girls. Um, I think in terms of, so access to contraception is really low and it's often particularly low for unmarried girls. And I think that's, that's probably one of the, to me, that's one of the biggest policy um, implications of all of this, really. I mean, what's the point in kind of trying to change norms and behavior if you haven't actually provided the basic services? Um, so there's very little access and there's very little knowledge. And um, so I think that's really, really quite a serious impediment. So health policy does need to focus on that as well, because otherwise, you know, raising the age of marriage can put girls at, 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 at risk of, of pregnancy out, outside marriage. Um, I think it's worth highlighting, actually, from our quality of data, things have changed dramatically, and maybe I didn't make that point, but actually, we've got grandmothers and mothers in the sample who were married at the age of nine, and we have one or two who were divorced several times by the age of 20 and many who had you know, six or seven or eight children by the age of 20. Actually, the situation of current, the current generation of girls is so much better. And that's the case also for India and most of the, I mean, India is the, the big country in the world now where this is a biggest concern still, but actually even there, rates of early marriage are going down. So I think there are some big trends globally which are actually quite hopeful. Whether or not that trans translates into better jobs and more decent jobs for girls, I think that's another matter. Can I just, just add to that that um, the right to, to reproductive health and reproductive freedom is something which is, is gaining more and more emphasis in the human rights framework and, and certainly should do. The um, Sustainable Development Goals do uh, promise to have universal access to reproductive uh, care and health, uh, including contraception. They don't mention abortion because I think they couldn't get agreement on that. But it, there is that commitment, um, which probably, which I, I think from the human rights perspective, is a very important point now is to make sure that whatever human rights apparatus there is needs to be properly used to achieve that promise in 2030, in the next 15 years. Um, and there are various rights to equality, to health, which could be used to call governments to come to make this a real possibility. And again, working together with cultural norms means that uh, we have to think about how to do that effectively rather than whether to do it at all. Okay, well, this is our last question now. Yeah, I have the microphone. All right, so, so education is one of those things that, um, like, it's a great, like, well, like thing that everybody sort of like you know advocates for um, I mean we even say this like it being like part of like the you know like the global um, MPI you know like as like one of the dimensions and all of that but yet what we're seeing in the data from like Ethiopia for example um, like education isn't actually exactly translating into like people's expectations um, economically and then what you were also talking about like just like everything that you were saying um, it's not very clear to me that it like what is the argument for education then? Like, should people even be spending like so much money trying to get education, so many years, you know, like trying to get education if it's not translating into what they actually expect economically? Or like, why should we be getting an education? Wow. <laughs> okay, so there's actually, we have very clear evidence that the children who were able to access early childhood programs, so this is not even talking about school, across all of our four countries, they do better 
even way down the line, age 12 and into their teens. Um, we don't know quite why it is, but it seems as though, you know, having access to adults outside the home, perhaps engaging with others, stimulation that you get outside the home does seem to have some positive effects. So I think in terms of human development, rights of citizenship, rights to information, all of that, I don't think there's any question education is extraordinarily valuable. I think, however, your point is really important in relation to whether it actually gets decent jobs. And I think that, that the plans that were laid in place in the 20th century, which were very much about you know, massification of access to education, that's now been achieved. I mean, enrollment in the Young Lives countries is pretty much um, universal in primary level. It, it drops off in secondary school. The problem, I don't think, was imagined at that stage that there would be such a big problem with education quality. So actually, we, when we compare our cohorts in Ethiopia, the quality is actually going down in some respects. So the younger ones are not doing as well as the older ones were in some, some aspects. That's possibly a cost of massification, bringing more children into school, which has definitely happened. I think that the problem was that nobody really knew what they were doing when they were saying that education was the answer for everything, because they weren't taking into account the reduced supply and the increasing reduction in supply of jobs, and particularly in supply of, of good jobs. So the Asian tigers, for example, grew on jobs. Their, their economic growth was based on, on employment. That's not the pattern of today, or it will not be the pattern of the future. And I know that you know recent concerns have been raised about robotics, um, digital technologies and so on, actually replacing more and more young people in the workplace. And so I think, that, I think education will always have a really important role in lots of aspects. We know that educated mothers raise healthier children, they raise, you know, there's so many benefits, not necessarily, however, the ones that we imagined in relation to work. And I think there's a lot more to be done to link education systems up to the jobs that are available. One of, the, one of the things we're now doing in the study is um, assessing what we call 21st century skills, which is about digital access, digital knowledge, critical thinking, problem solving. Vietnamese um, government is held universally throughout the world uh, up high for its, its performance in education. Vietnamese school, uh, school children are doing brilliantly in all kinds of subjects. They do far better than children in the UK, for example. But the Vietnamese government's not happy with it because they know that the kinds of skills that are being taught, learning by rote, is not actually the kind of skills that's needed for the 21st century. So I think that's where the real challenge lies. And that's not a challenge that could be answered by education systems alone. Uh, can I just Please say one, one, one last thing about that? Um, so when we look at the right to education, we also need to distinguish between instrumental and intrinsic uh, views of the right and if, if we look at it entirely instrumentally then you know you could come to that conclusion that if it's not leading to decent jobs we may as well not have it but I think and it comes out again of, of from from the work that you do that it, it, the right to education still is an intrinsic right which is a, a right in itself regardless of its instrumental value and it's um, it, it sh should be viewed in that sense as giving people enhancing people's capabilities and giving people agency and, and, and ways of thinking. And, but on the other hand, coming back to the original point of this joint collaboration, the, 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 by seeing the way in which these things work from, from the, the, the data that you have, it's important to feed that back into the way in which the right education is structured. And as I said before, we've, we've already had a, a big push to seeing right education as right to quality education, but also Many understandings of the right to education see it as starting at age six or seven, a right to basic education, and only very recently the whole idea of the right to preschool education, the right to early education is coming in. And to, to, you know, to its credit, the Sustainable Development Goals do talk about um, bringing in early education for everyone, but that also has to be fed into the human rights framework to make sure that right to quality education it really does matter to people. Okay, um, that it's, thank you very much. It's been a, a very rich discussion. There's, there were still lots of hands, so that's um, a, a great sign. So thank you very much for all your questions. Um, and perhaps we could just close now with the last uh, round of applause for Joe and Sandy. Thank you. Thank you.